Heavy Bomber Squadron takes off on a long-distance operation against the enemy. Flying with great speed at high altitudes, they avoid detection, drop their loads, and are off for home before enemy fighters and pursuit planes can possibly climb 25, 30,000 feet or even higher. In these cold substratosphere regions of the sky, where the air is so thin it affects engines as well as men, the fastest enemy planes are no match for our B-17s or our B-24s, which return safely to their bases. Air supremacy is a vital factor, perhaps a deciding factor in this war. The achievement of air supremacy involves speed, personnel, firepower, and maneuverability. But one of the most important factors is the ability to achieve maximum altitude without the loss of power. The Civil War maxim of getting that trustus with the mostest men can be revised in the terms of military aviation to getting up highest with the mostest fighting power. This master of the skies, the dynamic turbo supercharger, is the reason for our air superiority at high altitudes. For the year 1941, the Collier Trophy, one of the highest honors in aeronautics, was awarded jointly to Dr. Sanford A. Moss and the Army Air Forces for 25 years of collaboration in perfecting the turbo supercharger, which is playing a leading role in sweeping our enemies to defeat. The turbo supercharger makes possible high altitude flying with full engine power. An airplane engine derives its power from explosions of a mixture of air and gasoline. At altitudes above sea level, the air gets thinner and thinner. Therefore, these explosions get weaker and weaker. At 20,000 feet, an unsupercharged airplane engine gives but one half its normal power. At 35,000 feet, only a quarter of its power. The turbo supercharger counteracts this loss of power by compressing and cramming air into the engine, thereby maintaining proper manifold pressure to give full power at high altitude. It performs the same service for engines that oxygen equipment performs for pilots, kidding the engine into thinking it is always working at sea level. Without a turbo supercharger, the engine gasps for breath. During World War I, the first model turbo supercharger was tested under great difficulty. On a truck at the summit of Pikes Peak, 14,100 feet above sea level. The Liberty engine developed 400 horsepower at sea level, but moving up to 14,000 feet, it dropped to 265 horsepower. Then the turbo supercharger not only boosted it up to 400 horsepower, but to 410, or 10 more than normal at sea level. The turbo supercharger has demonstrated its worth in actual combat all over the globe. Our great bombers, the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress and Consolidated B-24 Liberator, together with the Lockheed P-38 Interceptors, the P-43 Lancer, and the deadly Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, are all turbo supercharger equipped, which enables them to fly and fight effectively at great heights above the Earth. Our turbo supercharged interceptors and pursuits can get on top and stay on top of anything the enemy has to offer. These tactical advantages are the key to air supremacy and ultimate victory. Turbo superchargers permit our bomber pilots to avoid bad weather, even storms, by climbing over them, making it possible to fly at altitudes and speeds which result in maximum engine efficiency. Obviously, we have a decided edge when we can bomb the enemy with a minimum of danger to our planes and personnel. Flying turbo supercharged planes, our boys have bombed enemy objectives with amazing accuracy from heights where they were invisible and unheard from the ground. There had been no warning sirens, no opportunity to take shelter, only the sudden scream and paralyzing crash of bombs falling out of a clear sky.
Almost without exception, these planes have returned safely from their missions. Time after time, you have read of our big bombers returning unscratched from perilous raids in all theaters of the war. It is true that our heavy bombers have been in dogfights, have suffered casualties in men and planes, but in practically every instance, this has happened when planes were operating at levels below 25,000 feet. Another reason we have to get up higher and higher is to get above the effective range of anti-aircraft fire, which has been reported even above 30,000 feet. All combat planes are equipped with gear-driven superchargers, which are built into the engines and driven from the engine crankshaft. These geared superchargers are effective up to medium altitudes. At high altitudes, the turbo supercharger is needed to provide additional pressure to maintain full engine power. With proper care in installation, maintenance, and operation, the turbo supercharger is extremely effective, reaching its full power and efficiency at 25,000 feet or higher. This is the turbo supercharger installation in the B-17. Installations vary according to the different types of ships, such as the B-24, the P-38, the P-43, and the P-47, where it is submerged in the fuselage. A turbo supercharger is driven by the terrific impulse of hot exhaust gases from the engine. It largely uses waste power. Waste exhaust gases pour into the nozzle box where they are directed onto a metal windmill or turbine wheel at 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit with all the red-hot energy that implies. This blazing force spins the turbine wheel at terrific speeds up to about 20,000 revolutions per minute. The turbo supercharger stands the gap of almost impossible high-speed strains and stresses and still performs its task at temperatures ranging from 1,500 degrees above to about 67 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. The basic principle of all turbo supercharger installations is outlined in this diagrammatic drawing. Flexible joints are installed between the component parts to absorb vibration. For purposes of clarity, we will divide the system into five parts. One, the induction system. Two, the exhaust system. Three, the ventilating or cooling system. Four, the control system. And five, the lubrication system. Individual installations vary according to the different design of ships, but their functions remain the same. The induction system comprises rammed air intake in the engine nacelle or in the leading edge of the wing. The speed of the plane rams air into these intakes and assists in keeping up pressure. Ducts carry this air to the compressor where it is compressed and forced through the intercooler and the carburetor to the inlet of the geared supercharger. The geared supercharger is used to do part of the required supercharging and to improve the distribution of the fuel charge to the cylinders. The exhaust system takes the high temperature exhaust gases from the engine to turbine wheel or out through the wastegate to the atmosphere. The cooling or ventilating system cools the supercharger parts, thus preventing damage due to the high temperature exhaust gas. Rammed air is carried through ducts to the turbo, where the stream is split by the baffle plate and cool air forced against the bearing housing, compressor casing, the back of the turbine nozzle box, and the back of the turbine wheel. Other ducts perform the same functions in relation to the exhaust stack shroud, which insulates the exhaust stack and the air intercooler, which for proper combustion reduces the temperature of the air fed from the compressor to the engine. The intercooler cools air in the same way the radiator on your car cools water. The cooling cap supplies air to the rim of the turbine wheel to lower temperature of the wheel disc. The turbo supercharger is controlled by a hydraulic regulator, which operates the wastegate in response to pressure changes in the exhaust stack. The wastegate control is adjusted by a boost lever in the cockpit. The wastegate 
control speed of the supercharger by bypassing the gases around the wheel. With the wastegate open, the turbine will idle. Closing it by degrees enables the turbo supercharger to operate at required speeds. Lubrication is accomplished by a gear-driven pump. One element of the pump takes oil from the tank and supplies it under pressure to the moving parts. The second, or scavenging element, returns the oil to the tank. Like every other part of a modern military airplane, the turbo supercharger must be understood by pilots who should remember important instructions regarding control. Before starting the engines, be sure that the turbo supercharger is in the off position. No provision is normally made to supply engine air except through the turbo, its ducting, and intercoolers. Therefore, considerable resistance will be imposed on airflow to the engine when the turbo regulator is in the off position. In order to obtain sufficient manifold pressure for takeoff power, it is necessary on some airplanes to use a small amount of turbo boost. Close the wastegate a little. Tactical requirements may dictate using military rated power for a period not exceeding five minutes. Climbs are usually made with about normal rated power. Small adjustment of the turbo control may be necessary during climb to keep manifold pressure at desired level. For low altitude, low power cruising, when the geared supercharger is enough to provide proper manifold pressure, reduce engine throttle to maintain the desired manifold pressure. At high altitudes of more than 20,000 feet, it is not practicable to operate at very low engine speeds and powers. Turbo superchargers should be kept engaged at all times when induction system icing may be encountered. Above approximately 25,000 feet, manifold pressure should be reduced in accordance with the instructions given for each type of plane to avoid overspeeding the turbo supercharger. For gliding and approach for landing, the turbo regulator is set approximately at maximum cruise position to ensure power to go around the field again if necessary. The performance of ships equipped with turbo superchargers is a matter of teamwork between ground crews and pilots. It is not necessary for a pilot to learn all the mechanical details of construction, but it is wise for him to know what he can expect from a turbo supercharger when he needs his assistance to win the fight, save the lives of his crew and himself. The men who fly these powerful planes are going to depend upon their turbo superchargers in emergencies which will test all their skill, strength, and courage. Operation and control are largely automatic, but there are certain times when the pilot needs power and needs it instantly. These times occur under stress of actual combat conditions, and his reaction should be instinctive. The pilot will depend upon this master of the skies to give him the edge of speed and maneuverability, which means the difference between defeat and victory in the substratosphere regions of the sky. It is with enormous pride in American scientific invention and mechanical ability to look at our interceptors and pursuits, which can get on top of anything that flies. It is with a feeling of grim satisfaction that we know our bombers are able to shoot down or escape from anything the enemy can put in the air. But this edge is held only as long as the turbo superchargers on each and every one of these planes is kept at the peak of performance. They must answer every demand that the pilot makes. It's up to the ground crews to keep them flying and flying higher and higher. Ride the master of the skies to victory. Thank you.